when I first came to the first ever meeting of the Property and Finance Society, that was four years ago in this very same place, I was really looking forward to it. Not just because I had finally found an economic theory that made sense, Austrian economics. Not just because I had finally found a uh, philosophical uh, theory of politics uh, that made sense, that's uh, anarcho-capitalism. Not just because I had found a theory of, of ethics and morality that finally made sense, the ethics of private property. No, I was looking forward to it mostly because I thought the society would be, for me, a support group. You see, I was not a normal man. I was an investment banker. And it's not easy being an investment banker. <laughs> Everybody hates you or despises you or both. For example, I am French, so I have a lot of French friends. And you know how French has been brainwashed by Marxism. So whenever I go back to my French friends, they think that I am a capitalist pig who bathes in the blood of the people. And they even said it to me at New Year's Eve parties. Even Happy New Year to you. Huh? So, um, I, as Hans mentioned, in my previous career, I was a university professor. And when I announced to my dear uh, professor colleagues that I was leaving to go to uh, Wall Street. They thought I was prostituting my considerable intellectual talents for something as base as money. <laughs> so I don't know which is worse, being a prostitute or being a capitalist thing. Naively, I thought that by coming here, at least uh, I'd find some people who uh, respect my profession. I would be uh, some kind of capitalist hero. Um, <laughs> imagine how disappointed I was when I realized that members of the property and fuel society thought that investment bankers are thieves. <laughs> As Hans put it uh, elegantly, people who enrich themselves at others' expense without anyone noticing it, which is the title of my talk. At this first meeting in 2006, some brave souls tried to explain to me why I was a thief, but I have to admit I did not understand a single word. Um, I think uh, I didn't want to understand. It's only after uh, much study at home, coming back for many months of Austrian economics, that I understood the penny drop that I was a thief and exactly why. So that's what I'm going to explain to you today. Um, just in case anybody wonders, I'm not giving back the loot. Right? Murray Rothbard has been very clear about that. Uh, even if you're in a capitalist, you can work for the state. I mean, he did himself work for state universities. So it's completely okay as long as you don't do anything evil, like shooting people, torturing them, or collecting taxes. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any of that, so I'm um, completely fine. Um, this is a very special kind of thie thievery, uh, the most elegant kind, because uh, like uh, Sun Tzu said, the art of war is to uh, conquer the enemy without uh, firing the gun. Uh, the art of thievery is to steal without the victim knowing that it's being fleeced. But the sum of this is that the thief himself doesn't know he's stealing, which was my case. Obviously. So here we go. Uh, I will anchor the presentation on a quote by Jim Rogers, who's a very nice guy. He co-founded the Quantum Fund with George Soros. Uh, retired at age 37, and uh, recently he left with his wife and two daughters uh, to Singapore because he just didn't believe in the US anymore, so his apartment in Central Park. And uh, he's often quoted on DuraCall.com uh, on commodities. Uh, so his quote, very famous, you repeated it on TV many times. Uh, you don't see any 29 year old cotton farmers driving around in Maserati, but you do see a lot of 29 year olds on Wall Street driving around in Maseratis. And this is not the world, the way the world is supposed to work. <laughs> this is a Maserati. <laughs> in order to uh, figure out what's going on here with Jim Rogers' quote, we need to have a model of the world, or more specifically of the economy. And that model of the economy is that the market is a social network. Social networks are all the rage nowadays, 
uh, Facebook, social network, MySpace, I think even Sean Gabs on LinkedIn now, so really everybody's on it. Um, the internet is just a big social network also because each web page links to only a few of all the possible web pages in the world. And those few links give a certain topology to the internet, which is exploited by Google and PageRank. Um, but similar in social network, that is the market because there are so many butchers, but only buy the meat from always the same one or two butchers and so forth. So in this social network, every arrow represents a relationship between a buyer and a seller. And you see that not everybody buys and sells from everybody. So this is, a, I think, a realistic model. Um, we, we have only 26 people because I ran out of, um, of letters. <laughs> and I put the arrows more or less randomly. But that will be enough to illustrate uh, the uh, purpose today. Um, there is a, a folk theorem about social networks, which is a six degrees of separation theory. It says that anybody in the world, um, like a gondolier in Venice, is related to anybody else, President of the United States, through six degrees of they know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows that person. It's not really proven, but it seems to hold true with most social networks. And they even made a movie out of it. So, we're going to pick somebody at random in this social network, which is the economy, like Mr. B, for example. And we're going to look at his social network. He buys from C, J, and M, the people who are in red. So their first degree of separation from Mr. B. They're his first circle. In turn, the people in red, they buy other goods and services from the people in orange, E, L, R, G, C, and D. So these are the second degree from Mr. B. They're twice removed, second degree of separation. And so forth, you can give different colors to all the circles. And at the end, I designed the network so they'd be exactly six degrees. So the people in violet, V and Z, are the furthest removed from Mr. B uh, through economic transactions. They don't trade directly. They are quite far, they're six degrees apart from each other. You can see the whole network now with all the colors. Uh, it is useful to then represent the economy as a series of concentric circles around Mr. B. Uh, remember C, J, and M in red, the first circle, the inner circle, orange, and so forth, and V and Z in the outer circle of the economy furthest removed from Mr. B. Where does this uh, lead us? We can take this model for a spin and inject money into it. <coughs> Mr. B then will be the one who injects money. He creates money out of thin air, so Mr. B is B for Ben Brunner. <laughs> <laughs> so when he does so, he doesn't just sort of give the money away to people, even to his first circle. He can't do that because that would be conspicuous. He'd print the money, give it to his friends, that would be conspicuous. And that would qualify as uh, stealing without anybody else knowing <coughs> because everybody would notice that. So what he does is he takes this newly printed money and he buys something with it. Well, that looks okay. You know, we buy and we sell things all the time. And Mr. B goes shopping. So who is in the first circle relative to Mr. B? Well, first it was shopping for labor from macroeconomists and monetary economists. Uh, most monetary economists actually work for the Fed or have taken money from the Fed in the past. So that's what he does. He also buys uh, treasury bonds. And he buys toxic debt produced by Wall Street. You can see the balance sheet of the Fed has uh, in blue sorry, at the bottom the treasury bonds. And everything else is toxic debt produced by Wall Street. I don't see any economists in the balance sheet, but they're in the income statement. So that's the first circle. Then in turn, the second circle, these people turn around and Fed economists will hire some doctors, <laughs> some butchers, whatever. Old civil servants, because they paid out of the treasury money, they're in the second circle. They sell the labor to the state. Uh, and 29 year old Muslim bankers who are the friends of uh, Jim Rogers, they're also in the second circle because they are selling their labor to investment banks. 
Now, we're not going to go through all the circles. In the third circle, there's a Maserati dealer. <laughs> Maserati to the second circle, a Muslim banker. And so forth, sixth circle. Ah, uh, who's in the sixth circle? Who is? The rest of us, yes. So uh, there's a 29 year old daughter of Robert, there's a Jim Rogers other friend, uh, and there's the rest of us, the average voter, normal people, to summarize Main Street. Okay? Now, assume Mr. B doubles the quantity of money, what's going to happen? It's not just an assumption, because this is what happened to the quantity of money. Uh, since 1917, uh, obviously he, he did double it at the end, but even before that, it was always sort of increasing. Uh, I know the Fed could, in theory, drain money out, but cumulatively it's pretty clear that it's only going up. So then what's going to happen in the economy when he does that? The first step is that he's going to turn around and buy things from his first circle. That means that the prices of goods and services produced by the first circle will go up. There'll be more demand. Ben will come in with pockets full of wads of cash and just buy everything in sight. That means that people who are in the first circle will have more money because they have more demand for their, their goods. They will turn around and buy stuff with it, real stuff, the stuff they will consume. And because of the structure of the economy, they'll buy from the second circle. Okay. So they are better off. They have more money, they buy stuff, they consume it, they're happy. That's the first step. But then you see we've done something with the second circle. We've bought more of their stuff, so there's going to be a trickle-down effect here. Uh, surely the price of goods and services produced by the second circle will go up. Not directly because of them, but indirectly through the first circle. Uh, they'll have more money and they can buy more stuff from the third circle, but there is a but here. What they can't do is they can't buy anything from the first circle anymore, because Ben Bernanke has outbid them. Everything's first circle is really, the price went up too fast, too high, they can't compete. They have a bit more money, but only by buying the stuff in the third circle, which, whose price hasn't gone up yet, can they consume something. So they're not ambiguously worse off or better off. They're, they're better off in one way, but they're worse off because they can't buy anything from the first circle. Well, you see where this is going. Now we touch the third circle, same thing. And once again, they're better off because they can buy more stuff from the fourth, but less worse off because they can buy less stuff from the first and second because prices have gone up before they could see the money. So fourth, Fifth circle. Right, go to the sixth circle. So eventually, the money will trickle out to them. Prices will go up of the goods produced in the sixth circle. They'll have more money, more dollars, more digits, if you wish. Uh, but they can't afford anything with it. They can't buy anything from the first, second, or the fifth circle. They can't. They've been so priced out of all this consumption that they used to have. And they can't turn around to stuff in the seventh circle because there's, no such, there's no such thing. So they are an ambiguously worse off. Okay. So that was the that's the theory. And um, we can summarize that by saying that creating money out of thin air just transfers the wealth from the outer circles of the economy to the inner circles from Main Street to Wall Street. Graphically, you can see the wealth flowing from the outskirts to the center. And if you look at it sort of sideways, um, if you are in the circle close to the center, you're better off. Otherwise, at the outskirts, you are worse off. So then, we can answer Jim Rogers. We can explain to him why he saw what he saw. 29-year-old investment bankers, they drop Maserati because they are the first among the first ones to lay their hands on the newly created money. Whereas 29-year-old cotton farmers are among the last to lay their hands on the newly created money. And that is why they do not drive Maseratis. 
<coughs> now, that's, there's nothing surprising to this. It's an intrinsic feature of the modern economy. It's not an abuse of the system. It has to be like this because as long as money gets created, it has to be created somewhere. And whoever is standing close by will get first dibs, the better off. There's no other way to do this. As long as you give somebody the right to create money out of thin air. Obviously, I did not come up with this. Richard Cantillon did. He um, lived uh, from 1618 to 1734. <laughs> But it's called the Cantillon effect. He has a Spanish name, Cantillon, uh, but he was born and raised in Ireland and made his fortune in France, speculating uh, on John Law's bubble, which was the real first big bubble of paper money. And he, uh, he saw it, he lived in it, he made money with it, he understood it, and then he wrote the book. <laughs> he wrote this book. Everything here is false. It's not translated from the English. Uh, because at the time he was worried that he would throw to jail, so they just pretended that uh, that was translated from the English, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And Fletcher, Giles, and Holborn, they don't exist. The editors don't exist. So at the time he had to uh, play a few tricks to get published. Mm -hmm. This is what he said in, um, in his book. He, he didn't talk about paper money, he said, suppose gold money is created out of, not out of thin air, but out of the ground, from a gold mine. So whoever is hovering around this gold mine, the uh, owners of the mine, the adventurers, the explorers, founded, the smelters, the refiners, all the workers, they'll be better off, because they're the first ones to lay their hand on the newly minted gold. They'll be accustomed to better clothes, finer linen, better furnished house, houses. However, the share of the other inhabitants who are further removed from the creation of gold money, from the gold mine, well, they have less share of all the good things in life. Less meat, less wine, less wool. So right there, you have exactly what I said before, the outskirts get uh, really hurt. That was sort of how mainstream economics was done uh, in this time. And, uh, <coughs> it stayed like this for a long time. We can actually understand this sentence. Uh, now, this paper, I have presented it at some universities, I have written it up for publication in a mainstream economics journal, and this way it looks like it. <laughs> if we vectorize this expression and multiply both sides from the left of the matrix A, we obtain beta minus 1 AM equals MA1 plus AP, where 1 denotes a conformable vector of 1s. And so it continues like this for many pages. Right here we have uh, the square root of minus one. Uh, if you like the and uh, exactly the same paper as I presented to you, but I had to do a few fancy tricks to get it published. Okay, so the system only works because some people are cheerleading for it. And who are these cheerleaders? Well, they are the macroeconomists. They say, we need to keep this system going, otherwise there'll be no growth. Um, the government says, well, we need to keep this system going, otherwise there'll be a riot in the street. And the investment banks say the same thing. They say, oh, we need to keep this system going, otherwise there'll be a recession. And um, funnily enough, they are the ones who live in the first circle. So they all parade on television, one after the other, and uh, they say, well, it's a good system. <laughs> How do they pacify the average voter on the outskirts who gets uh, hurt? They uh, have obfuscation. Nobody actually understands any of this. Um, but more than that, they have the old scapegoat technique, where they point the finger at the scapegoat. And who is that? That's our friend, the 29-year-old investment banker driving Maserati. And he's not really the worst offender in there. I mean, I think uh, the state definitely benefits more from the system. And uh, the economics profession also. But you know, there you go. It's investment banker. So, is investment banking immoral? Um, well, it depends. If you're willing to end the Fed, as Ron Paul's uh, book, if you're willing to denounce fractional reserve banking as fraudulent, if you are willing to repeal legal tender laws and enact the separation of money and state, like church and state has been separated. 
then yes, you have the right to criticize investment bankers. <laughs> so that would be you, please. <laughs> Everybody else better shut up. Okay? <laughs> beloved Model T, if it is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system, for if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow. <laughs>